Growing up, she was always the other Anna. And so it's really funny because now I have the other Anna in my adult life. Um, but this is the other Anna who will be leading this wonderful salon for all of us. For those of you whose first time it is at Culture Hub, we are the Art and Technology Center at La Mama. We were founded in a partnership between La Mama and the Seoul Institute of the Arts in 2009. We have uh, education programs, art and technology programs, uh, research initiatives. Uh, global community programs and um, our annual festival where you are right now. Um, if you have not signed our mailing list, I uh, really strongly encourage you to do so. We are, don't share it with anyone and we have a lot of really exciting programming coming up. And I think that is all I have to say. So thank you so much for coming and I will hand it over to the Anna. Thank you. Uh, how's everybody doing? Good. Good. I was just saying I was so busy getting people to come upstairs that I actually didn't even think about what I wanted to say. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, tonight's going to be fun. So we have about four different people um, and also organizations that are going to be presenting and discussing their work. Um, and it's all it's sort of commentary on surveillance sort of technologies, examining what surveillance sort of means in our lives. Um, and I'm very excited. There are going to be some great performances. So thank you all for coming. And um, so unfortunately, our, well, not unfortunately, our first presenters are going to be my students, but unfortunately one of them has bronchitis, and so she was not able to come tonight. So I'm actually going to present um, a couple pictures that she sent along um, about her project in particular. Um, so the, my students um, who are here, Paulette and Travis, and Bianca is the one who can't be here tonight, um, they're doing an amazing project uh, that's documenting public space and looking at particularly the relationship between public space and the health and wellness of our communities. And uh, Bianca's project is looking at, it's called NYPD Get Off of Me, and it's looking at uh, police brutality uh, and documenting sites of police brutality specifically in communities of color in New York City. Um, so do we have those photos available to take a look at? Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so the site, um, all of the students are documenting five public spaces in New York City. Um, and the site that Bianca chose to share with you all today is the site uh, where Amadou Diallo was murdered. Um, and so what they're looking at in the photos is they're, they're taking pictures of the surrounding community, um, you know, to get an idea of, like, who is living there, who's using the spaces. Um, we can go to the next photo. Um, and this is actually uh, the building, in, uh, and Amadou Diallo was shot in front of this building. Um, can keep going. Is that, that's your photo, isn't it? I think maybe go to the next photo. That's her photo as well. Hold on one second. Yeah, that third one. Okay, great. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so the uh, so 
Bianca, what she chose to do to sort of commemorate the sites of where police brutality happened um, was she used, a, so she is using um, an Adinkra symbol. Um, and what she's doing is uh, taking photos with people holding the symbol in front of the site uh, where the police brutality has happened. Um, and so this was, I believe, this is her friend who came along with her to help document the site. And so then what happens after the sites have been documented is we're creating sort of an online media archive um, of where, of all of these particular sites. Um, so people will be able to like virtually look on a map where these sites are and then see the corresponding pictures um, to, to the sites. So that is, <laughs> Bianca would have done a much better job presenting her project, uh, but, but that's the overview of her project. Um, and do we have one more photo for her SO? Oh, I think that's a repeat. That's fine. We can move on. We can move on to the next one. So Bianca can't be here. Those are her photos. Uh, but we will turn it over now to Paulette. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, you could just flick through my photos. They're just of a building. I don't have a specific thing to say for each one. Uh, well, I could talk about my project. Um, I'm basically documenting abandoned school buildings in New York City. Um, the purpose of documenting these spaces are to explore the race relationships between the abandoned buildings and the surrounding communities. Um, my objective is to provide a compre comprehen comprehensive information about the demographics of these communities and how it affects the public resources available as well as to demonstrate the importance of community surveillance in protecting public goods and services. Um, the pictures <laughs> that were up um, is of PS 186 um, in Hamilton Heights on 145th Street. The school was built in 1901 and was closed in 1975. Um, it was bought by the Boys and Girls Club in the 1980s, but they just started doing renovations on it this fall. And I didn't even know about it until I went to take the pictures uh, that I saw of the cranes and the construction work workers. Um, what was interesting in me documenting these spaces is that there's almost no information available. Like when I was trying to find the official reason these schools were closed, is more hearsay. Like, oh, there was violent attacks or the problems with the building code, but I felt it was, it, it was interesting that I couldn't find a real reason. Um, but yeah, in researching the, re the reasons of the school um, and why they remain empty so long, I found more questions than answers. And I just thought um, there should be a way to make the information more accessible to the public. This is, you're paying for it with public funds, so you should, should have public information. Um, the common link between all the schools, uh, that was just one in Hamilton Heights, um, another one at, um, also in Harlem, and one in Grand, Car Grand Concourse um, in the Bronx. Um, the common link in all the schools uh, is the demographics. They're all predominantly minority communities well, and low income. So um, the questions I came up with that I feel need to be answered is how do we empower the public and the communities to take actions in, protect in protecting public goods and services? Um, why are all these schools, or why are all these abandoned schools located in minority communities? Uh, how can the public afford to have an empty school building for 39 years? And with issues of overcrowding, it just didn't make any sense to me. Um, and two of the five schools that are being renovated, well, none of them, the two that are being renovated are not being renovated as schools. They're turning into affordable housing. So where are these children going to go to school? Um, yeah. So that's basically it. I just have one question because I am looking for an, another space because it's hard to find um, the abandoned buildings. There's not a list for the school. Does anyone have any abandoned 
school buildings in their community that they know of? Thank you. Sterling and Pipe. Um, also, my father is in the Pipe City Center. Okay. Pipe oh, that would be great. <laughs> that would be great. And uh, that's about it. Um, I'm trying to. I have a question. Okay. Uh, why did you want to do this project? Why were you interested? Well, um, one of my interests is education and equity in education. And again, finding information on the statistics, it was, I realized it was heavily politicized. So you weren't, I wasn't getting any straight answers. And I'm like, how am I going to present information that is basically just hearsay and conflicting statistics? So that, and so I thought, well, abandoned school buildings will be easier. And, and it wasn't. It's the same issue of, of basically information. So. Yes, definitely. Yes, and exactly. Well, the name of the class. Well, the name of the class is New Media Activism, but I'm actually a film production major. major so, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's a part of a, a grant. Um, yeah. Kind of both or neither. I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, a lot of schools get graded through the DOE, and so if they get a bad enough grade, they're closed down. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if, if that goes as far back as some of these buildings, but that would be an interesting thing. And maybe yeah. if, I don't know how much the Freedom of Information Act can get you, but if you can look at DOE records or. Yeah. I. It's, it's very strange. Like I, I went, I was went to the city hall library, and they don't have any information before, well, after 1960, and so they were telling me to go to community boards, which, which is great, but that's <laughs> a whole nother. It would take way more time than I have in this semester to do. So I'm still kind of see what information I can find, but it's been difficult. Okay, and I'm gonna. Hello, hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Travis, and I'm a student at SUNY Empire State College. Uh, my project revolves around the loss of culture in New York City in recent years. And the channel I'm going through to explore this topic is the New York, New York City's parks and how many of them get a lot of attention by means of lowering crime rate and opening programs for students and adults, uh, keeping them open beyond um, regular business hours for uh, bigger programs, just to keep the interest alive and to keep people uh, using these green spaces. So as I discuss this, I'd like you to keep in mind uh, the question, how would you define green space? Um, this is a picture that's posted in m almost every c uh, New York City park. Uh, basically, it's rules telling you what you can and can't do. You can't barbecue. The parks are open from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, and this one in particular is uh, posted on Rupert Park, which is on the Upper East Side, down the block from another park that didn't have a sign posted. I guess it was ripped down. But both parks are within two blocks of each other. You can go on to the next photo if you can. Uh, you can keep scrolling. So 
So these two parks are very, they're small in size, nothing like Riverbank State Park and nothing like Central Park. However, one of them gets more attention than the other by means of uh, cleanliness, uh, by means of uh, New York City police uh, patrol, and Rupert Park actually gets community patrol. So parents who live in the area are able to uh, take turns. It's kind of like a neighborhood watch. The other park down the block, um, the other park down the block doesn't get the same amount of attention. However, that park, this is the picture that I need, thank you. That park has never really seen crimes in the last two, three years. It could be that its placement is near a hospital. It could just be where, where it's placed. However, Rupert Park, with all of the uh, attention that it gets, it has seen a crime. And actually, two days ago, there was a shooting right outside of the park, which is right, right across the street from the 96th Street uh, train station on the 6th train line. So my project, um, basically what I try to do is I try to explore by um, doing research on organizations like the New York City Restoration Project, which is run by Bette Midler. I think it was started uh, a couple of years ago. Um, it keeps in mind how we can keep parks restored and what programs we can offer to keep people interested in utilizing the green spaces so that way they're not offered up to land developers. And that is another big issue that we're facing now in 2014, the loss of green spaces to developers from the Midwest and even other countries like China and many countries in Europe. Um, another um, Another project, uh, project for public spaces, uh, they work to save the establishment. However, th as much as they try to bring awareness through uh, social media forums and small community developments like little programs, uh, little uh, student films that have been created to just keep interest alive, not much gets done because after all, money trumps in many areas. So in building on this project, I looked for inspiration and I found inspiration in a project that was started that revolved around AIDS, the AIDS epidemic in 1986 in the city and how that changed a lot of residential areas. And the woman who started this project goes by the name of Dr. Mindy Thompson Fully Love. She wrote a book called uh, Root Shock. And basically that explores how major changes in small city neighborhoods, even if it's the shut, shutting down of a park or school or any other small business affects uh, the city as a whole and with the many many parks that are in New York City there are hundreds any one of them being shut down can affect the community and then that starts a domino effect and so the, some of the spaces outside of Rupert Park and the other park that I'm looking at are Central Park, Riverbank State Park and Van Cortlandt Park who now currently host many programs like horseback riding Central Park offers weddings on weekends and and things of that nature but now there are limited uh, resources and there's limited uh, chances to get permits to do many of uh, many programs at these parks. Uh, I, I know that last year uh, at Riverbank State Park there was a performance that was scheduled and the proper permits were um, acquired and the police shut it down five minutes after it began. It was a music festival, an urban music festival. That's how it was labeled online. And so that's my project. Those are the places that I'm looking at. And the reason why I asked you guys in the beginning to keep in mind what green space means to you is because this is the question that gets asked often. When research is done on these places, what does it mean to you to keep these green spaces intact? Do you ever think about how it would affect the community if it didn't exist anymore? And if not, perhaps this is the best time to start thinking about it. So thank you. to someone. Thank you, Travis. All right, so we're going to move on um, to Jonathan Federico and Carmel Pryor, um, who Jonathan graduated from New School uh, Media Studies program. Carmel is finishing up there. Um, and they're going to be talking about their project called Surveillance Selfie. And uh, yeah, I'll let you guys take it from here. <laughs> Okay. Hi, I'm Carmel. Hi, I'm Jonathan. <laughs> and um, we actually, we 
were lucky enough to be interviewed on BK Live last week, which was awesome, because um, our Surveillance Selfie project, which is mainly on Instagram, you can hashtag Surveillance Selfie, we'll explain more later. Smartphones, and if you have Instagram or Facebook, you can search the hashtag and you can see literally what the project is all about. So we thought that instead of, you know, standing up here and doing like a formal presentation that we would actually show you, it's like about 10 minutes, show you our interview on BK Live because we think that it was a really good way to introduce the project to you and also to give BK Live a shout out because it's um, public access media in Brooklyn, so, and we love that. So we'll show that and then we'll do some Q&A and maybe even do some like participatory surveillance selfies together. So roll it please, thanks SO. Cameras, computer, um, phones, pixelation. Invasion of privacy, control, uh, statistics. Privacy, security, freedom, darkness. I think of mass, I think of global, I think of like CIA, Edward Snowden, NSA, stuff like that comes to mind. Web, internet, uh, hackers, uh, passwords, username. More recently I just think about, I'm Muslim, so I think about what's been coming up in terms of surveilling Islamic communities and neighborhoods. I think of surveillance in the way that phone conversations are being monitored. Segregation, discrimination, um, security, insecurity, mistrust. Mistrust or distrust? Well, those two. People observing mirrors, carefulness. Well, selfie is undoubtedly one of those words that will define this moment in human history. But can the selfie be political? An online movement called hashtag surveilly, surveilly, let's try that again. Surveillance. Thank you, Tati, that's why we have co-hosts. <laughs> called hashtag surveillance selfie wants to spark debate over the implica implications of mass surveillance in the 21st century. <laughs> They believe the act of using a <laughs> smartphone to snap one's reflection in a surveillance camera or image on surveillance footage provides people the opportunity to watch the watcher and think critically about this new age of data collection, data exhaustion, and mass surveillance. So two New York City-based artists are the minds behind hashtag surveillance selfie, which will be exhibited at ReFest 2014, an art installation celebrating the convergence of new and old media. It can be seen from November 21st to 23rd at Culture Hub. To talk about how this project affects you and why you need to participate, we have Jonathan Frederico. Thank you for being here Thanks. with Carmel Pryor. Thank you for being here and joining us on BK Live. So, this whole surveillance thing, I'm just just shy of being a conspiracy <laughs> theorist. It feels very 1984. For like, sure. you know, you Google yeah. something, next thing you know, you've got ads. And the that's novel, like, not the year. Yes, yeah. 1984, very the novel. George Orwell. George Orwell, thank <laughs> we you. Went to school. Yeah. <laughs> we did, graduated college. from college. It's important <laughs> to make that note. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, it, that is how it feels. So, tell us why you guys thought that this project was important. Right. Okay. So, um, we felt that in the 21st century right now, it's a very important moment for us to think about surveillance. And it's a very pop culture issue as well when Edward Snowden came mm -hmm. out and he uh, leaked government documents that said that the NSA, NSA is watching us in ways like never before. Right. Um, you know, we all, our antennas kind of popped up mm -hmm. and I'm like, what's going on? Yeah. And so Jonathan and I were <coughs> trying to figure out a way to bring people into the conversation. You know, we all can't leak right. government documents, but right. there are other ways that we can 
think about surveillance on a daily basis, um, not just the government, corporations, and also surveillance of each other. And so that's why we came up with this really cool project. So Jonathan, we just saw you peeping yourself there doing a selfie yeah. in a yeah. bodega or one of these <laughs> shops. That was actually, thing. actually, that was in Astro Place in Kmart. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, so High it ranks. goes back to that Target aisle thing. Mm. Yeah, so that, that being said, we think when we hear selfie, our <clears throat> media connection is like some Kim Kardashian with right. the like puckered lips mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But you guys really, why are you bringing out the politics of that intersection between surveillance and the selfie? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, what's interesting about the selfie, right, is it's essentially just a self-portrait. Yeah. You know, it's become it's something new. much different in pop culture. Um, and it's become popularized via pop culture, but all it really is is a self-portrait. So if you take away Kim Kardashian and you yeah. take away obnoxious people at bars <laughs> taking pictures of themselves with their cosmopolitans, right. and you take it at face value, all it really is is a self-portrait. And it's a way of um, bringing in yourself um, in conjunction with a place, which I think in terms of surveillance is really, right. really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, so I started taking selfies of myself in surveillance cameras, and admittedly, it started out as something that was somewhat narcissistic. Well, I thought it was funny cool. Picture. It's like picture yeah. in picture, and I'm on yeah. TV. Yeah, it, it can be meta. It can, it can go to a lot of different places. It's fun to play with reflections and things like that. So at face value, it's actually fun and it's interesting. And if you're interested in media and photography, yeah. photography, it's a whole. It's an entry point to a lot of really interesting creative stuff. Mm -hmm. But then in, in doing it, I became aware, and then certainly with a lot of the people that I worked with um, via uh, the new school and what I had been studying there, we all started discussing and conversing on the topic. And mm -hmm. it brought up a lot of issues of surveillance, and, and what, you know, a lot of, it tapped into a lot of the moods and feelings we were having at the time. So, so do that. you think that the average person out there, though, really has a good idea of how much they're being watched? I don't think so. Right. I mean, so the video clip that you showed were uh, just some, like, six interviews that we've done. Mm -hmm. um, and most of them said that they don't really think about it on a daily basis. And that's kind of the point of surveillance. Mm -hmm. It's hidden. It's seamless. Right. Um, and I think what was important with the selfie as well is the smartphone component. So even the smartphone can be seen as a surveillance camera of sorts. You know, like it's tracking your data Absolutely. if you have your GPS on. Um, when you are uploading things on Facebook or Twitter, you know, that is also a way where your data is being surveilled as well mm -hmm. and sold to corporations and, you know, the ads that pop up on Google. And so most people don't. But then we also had a really interesting interview with a young woman who's Muslim. And mm -hmm. for her um, in New York and the surveillance of Muslims in New York, it was very um, present for her and mm -hmm. it was something that she thought about more so than maybe others. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of depends mm -hmm. on who you are. but. I think our project is also a playful way for people to think about it. It doesn't necessarily always have to be so serious. Right. It can be a way where you can, you know, create a poster and put that in the image and mm -hmm. you can play within the frame of the photo that you're taking. Um, you can think about digital surveillance in a way that's different. So. It's so kind of an invitation to do something You cool. guys have had us thinking about this now. So I wonder what separates the person who, and if it's, the question is, is it possible to not participate in this sort of surveillance culture? Have you bumped into any people who, outside of putting like aluminum foil on their heads <laughs> to keep people from talking right. to them, are opting out of this thing? And like, is there a way to stay off the grid surveillance wise? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> I think if you live in a big city like New York, uh, it's going to be really difficult to do that because our streets are, you know, constantly being surveyed, if not by DOT, then by surveillance that a private building puts up, for example, in front of, uh, you know, their doorway. So if you truly want to live in a, uh, situation where you are not at all being surveilled, you certainly cannot go online. Yeah. Right. And I, I think right. living in a major metropolis like New York, um, or really any American city, is probably not going to be advantageous to achieving that. 
Yeah, yeah. Like it's a, it would be hard. Place, though, like a born <laughs> style, you know. If you uh, well. if you pay with cash and you those are always my favorite movies when the guy comes out of the subway and he's in Times Square and you see him and five mm -hmm. seconds later they're just enveloped and you just become a part of that human wave like right. a mass. I think even if you did, you'd have to be really sci-fi about it. You've got like some yeah. alternate uh, online existence or rather yeah. you know, persona, right. but and you're hiding yourself. I think it's almost impossible. It is almost impossible, and like what Jonathan was saying, especially in this urban environment where there are surveillance cameras everywhere, and if you want, if you're an artist and you want to do anything to promote yourself or your mm -hmm. work, you have to be online, and right. Facebook, Twitter, you know, all of those mm -hmm. things you have mm -hmm. to, you know, be on. So I think what Surveillance Selfie does as well is it creates an opportunity for people to reimagine what they can do with the surveillance and mm -hmm. the, d the data they're contributing. So, you know, you can, there's a lot of fun things that people are doing where they're kind of hacking Facebook, yeah. right. where, you know, like for a week or so, they'll put something completely like anti to who they really are as a person mm. on Facebook as their status, yeah. for example, and they'll, they're, they will start following maybe companies that they would never follow right. just to Tom see Tom. what would yeah, happen. Exactly. Yeah. So what would happen. Using the tools of the master to tear down his own empire. Uh, yeah, well, I think. Well, I don't know, we get I don't know. yeah, because you yeah. can't really do that. Yeah. Um, so, but, wait, is it a problem then, or is it just a condition of the modern life? If it's so ubiquitous and you can't escape it, it can't be a problem. We're all here. Right, well, I think that's that's a really good point. I, I think it's really difficult to look at an issue like surveillance and identify it as good or bad, right. yeah. as a problem or not, or a solution. Um, I think the, the way that we generally, and really doing this project, I, I really started to pull myself back because you know, you have a tendency to want to go to this place, like, and they're watching you, yes. and they're doing this, mm -hmm. about, about, you know what I mean? And yes. you want to get all like, That's this me. is what I want to say. <laughs> no, and, and rightly so, because right. there are instances where it's gone too far, where it has hurt, mm -hmm. I think, people and societies and communities and in and, and, and many ways. But I think at the same time, we also have to realize that it can be a tool right. for positive and for good, and right. so let's look at the whole situation, let's think about what surveillance is, yeah. but then also too, in the digital space, let's kind of realize what's happening, I think, mm -hmm. a little bit more, yeah. and realize right. there are two places that we exist in the world, the digital and in the physical, yeah. and, right. um, and what do you look like and how you act, and how far are we able to take what we um, interpret from this footage and from this data, how mm -hmm. do we interpret it? That's really where the sure. crux of the problem is. Yeah, and I think it's really from. about thinking critically about exactly. what is online about you. I remember right. we were talking about something where there was a 19-year-old in an article who talked about how she smoked so much mm. marijuana, mm. and we were like, she will never get a job. <laughs> because right. when people Google her, that article is gonna come up, you know, right. going forward in the future. So I think that we've all gotten very comfortable with being super duper open. And, so much sharing. Right? Yeah, so much sharing, right. possibly oversharing. But Definitely. just like, I think for me, this, what I see, and I want to know what your future plans are for this project, of course, but I feel like it'll just make people think more critically. Is that what you wanted? Yeah. I mean, I would say really. that's probably our main goal, okay. is to just create awareness about, you know, what you are contributing yourself mm -hmm. right. in terms of, like, what you were saying, the 19-year-old and smoking weed. Yeah. You probably don't want to put that online. Right. But even it has larger implications as well in terms of um, our place in society and how much do we want to be monitored or not. Right. You know, part of it is about um, safety, but then part of it is also about privacy. Right. And so, you know, what are we willing to give up and not give up? Mm -hmm. And I think for us, it's like, it's a really interesting project to think critically, but it's also for play yeah. and for protest yeah. at the mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that, that we're all good. dying <laughs> for play and yeah. for protest. protest. Hashtag, <laughs> right now. Hashtag play and I'm protest. I'm tweeting that at commercial right. so immediately. This is our like, yeah. last 45 seconds, so I want you to let folks know how they can participate in yeah. hashtag surveilly, surveillance selfie and how I can say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how you can participate. Um, I challenge, we, we all challenge people to, um, to get out there with your smartphone and really anytime you feel like you're being surveyed, whether that's online or in the physical world, take a picture okay. um, and try to invoke that feeling into the picture or take a screenshot you know, on your computer or on your phone. 
simply upload it to Instagram or Facebook or both and hashtag it surveillance selfie. And that's that how easy. you can, that's easy. I don't have to download anything. You don't have to anywhere. download anything. I'll tell you my name. No, no, no. And they won't be tracking us. And <laughs> yep. And if you can do it by tomorrow, um, we'll try to include you in our exhibit yeah. at ReFest. So okay. we're going to leave you with some food for thought before you get out of here. Yes. Doesn't that turn you guys into the people who are surveilling the people who are noting the surveillance. Yes, mm. that was the goal. It was just to make us powerful. Yeah. powerful. <laughs> Pretty much. Okay. You figured them out, Brian. What can I say? Doctors can... evil. What no, we, we are subverting do, uh, what mm. surveillance was meant for. All now right, we people. are turning it around on you. Yes. <laughs> That's what it is. Teach. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Thank guys. You I'm for really excited us. about your project. Indeed, indeed. Hashtag surveillance, surveillance selfie. selfie. Set it. Yes. yes. <laughs> Hello. So, as you saw in the video, it's pretty simple. You just look on your iPhone, smartphone, computer, whatever, search the hashtag surveillance selfie, and you can see what we've started and what we've created. Um, and it's, it's been really an um, amazing experience. I started taking pictures. Carmel started taking pictures. Friends with us who are in the graduate program at the new school started taking pictures and surveillance cameras. Um, we've had people from Ethiopia, Brazil, um, all over the world continue um, and take pictures. And it's important, uh, I think, on two levels. Number one, this is a public art project. We used, in some of our surveillance selfies, um, an artist's work. His name is James Bridal. Um, and they can show you. They'll bring up a thing of James Bridal's work in just a second. But um, we took s s pictures in, a, um, in surveillance cameras uh, in a Rorsch map. Um, that's what he created, and we were able to take selfies in those. And um, and yes, there it is. Here we are, James Bridal's um, Rorsch map, which served as a basis of of what we did. It's a public art project, and we feel like this is a public art project that builds on other pro public art projects and conversations about surveillance. Yeah, just quickly, because um, I think this would be really fun for you guys to do. Even tonight, when we go and see the projection that Anna's going to do later outside. Um, so this is Rorschmap.com backslash NYC, obviously. And this is live New York City Department of Transportation footage right now. Um, so that's the corner of Houston and Broadway. And this is, oh, they're both Houston and Broadway. Okay. I also wanted Houston and Lafayette. But anyway, if you go to Rorschmap.com, there are over 100 different cross streets that you could look up. Um, in all of the boroughs. So if you're standing somewhere and you're like, hmm, I wonder if there's a traffic camera here, you could just go to that website on your phone, look it up, and you could just take a snapshot on your phone of you in the image. So we actually took some really cool photos one day. We, he wore bright blue, I wore bright red. We went into the middle of the street and we stood there and like made really big, um, you know, it was pretty cool. Um, and so that was another really interesting way to kind of make art and make it playful, the surveillance of ourselves. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you know how many surveillance cameras there are in New York City? Public or private? Or both? I both, I guess. I don't. I actually don't know off the top of my head. I don't think there. I don't think that we could know. And if you include your smartphone, how many does that add? Without the smartphone. Without the smartphone. Well, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I feel like if I gave you, I feel like I could probably Google it right now, and I feel. I I kind of feel like it would be a lie. I don't think it would be the true number. So I think that's another important reason why we need to start to talk about it. I think we need to encourage those who are su doing the surveilling to be more open and transparent about it. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. If you saw in the interview, a lot of the people that were, we asked about surveillance, they were giving contradictory statements. Security. Invasion of privacy. But, you know, safety. Those are things that are opposite of one another. So people have conflicting feelings about surveillance. I think they see it as something that's necessary in society. But at the same time, they're afraid of it, and they're nervous, and they don't understand why. We even had people, and I, we're going to do more with more of the interviews. We have, they've, 
they were fascinating and they, they go on for a really long time. But um, we even talked about people who wanted to participate in the project who felt almost as if that they were wrong in trying to take a snapshot of the surveillance footage and the exhaust that was given off by them when they did catch a camera of themselves in it. They felt like, oh no, I don't know if I should be doing this. What do you mean? It's you, you're there, they're taking pictures of you. You have every right to be able to do it. But why does that feeling come up? And we want people to, to explore that as well. And, you know, and, and hopefully in doing that, we understand that there really is no reason why we should be afraid. Per perhaps the reason that people have that that feeling or that sentiment is is that there are situations where that that would actually you know create create issues, uh, for example, at an airport or in a bank, right? So surveilling the surveillance systems in those locations actually have a different implication. Yeah, um, it feels scary. I mean, we had a friend of ours that came last night to the exhibit and she just gave a short anecdote about how she was, I think, in her place of business. Yep. Um, and she works at a corporation. Um, and she just wanted to take one in a simple surveillance camera by the elevator. And as soon as she was getting ready to do it, she's like, oh my gosh, like what will this mean? Will I be pulled over by security in the building? Will my boss find out? What does this mean? So I definitely, it's, it can feel very dangerous, but I think that's good because, um, like Jonathan was saying, it's your image. And so a part of our project is about um, taking back some kind of semblance of control of how much you're being monitored in physical and digital space and, you know, kind of recognizing watching the watcher and saying, hey, I see you watching me. What's up? And, um, you know, I think people also in our interviews were talking about how they would change their behavior once they realized they were being watched um, in physical space. And, you know, like when you walk into a CVS or Dwayne Reed, I, I personally feel this, because um, they have the TV. Like as soon as you walk through the doors and the TV is there, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's me. Oh, wait, am I actually going to steal something? I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, I guess it just kind of makes me feel like, well, maybe I was going to steal something. Why are they watching me? Oh, my God. Um, yeah. And I think that translates into the digital space, too. Um, you know, are we really our authentic sel selves on Facebook and Twitter? Probably not. What does that even mean? Um, so I think it's, it's not just, you know, big brother surveillance. It's also surveillance of one another online um, and knowing that you're being watched yeah. by people and, you know, maybe how that kind of puts your identity in distress, too. Uh, yeah. yeah, so and, and I think that's what makes our project kind of ironic is you know we're asking you to to post your surveillance selfie on Instagram on social media um, use those platforms I think one of the things that I noticed too and I'm I don't know has anybody here on their phone ever received a message like I was like on abcnews.com once and they said ABC News would like to know your current location and I got like a, a pop up and I'm like okay why does ABC News want to know I, I mean, if you must know I'm in the can you know, but why do you need to know my current location? Moments like that, the moment, not so much the image itself and how artistic it was, was important to me. It was the, that moment, that question concerned me because I was like, are you going to now send me stories based on where I live and what I know? Well, if you must know, I have two nieces. They're Muslim American as much as they are Italian American. And I am very interested in Muslim issues via them. I may not search those stories. I may not live in a Muslim country, I may not be Muslim. But I do care about that. But does that mean you're gonna curate my news based on what I'm searching for, based on you watching me? You watching me is not necessarily giving you the right information. So those moments, those surveillance selfie moments where your digital self is giving information to somebody and they're using it to do something or to feed you something or to give you information is just as important as anything else. Yeah. just sort of the, the duality of the use of the data, uh, which is, I think, uh, there's a little bit of um, sort of a double standard when it comes to things like that. In other words, 
when you do get a pop-up from some source that you that you don't necessarily want to interact with, it's an annoyance. Um, it's a little bit it's a little bit unnerving that that s some device knows where you are without your interaction. However, there is a part of it. Um, uh, for example, I landed here in New York City this morning and immediately went to a, my weather app to see what the weather was going to be like. And having that location service be able to immediately feed me the New York City weather was a convenience. So there's some duality to the annoyance and convenience, some duality to um, sort of the use of the information versus kind of being surveyed or watched when, when you don't feel as though that you, you deserve to be kind of tracked. And have you guys looked at how and where there's, uh, you know, wh where it's okay, I guess, and then where, you know, it beca wh where, the, where we delineate between where it's okay and a convenience and where it's not, and it becomes more of an invasion? Because um, I know we have to wrap up. Okay, so I, I don't think I personally want to trade my convenience for like the invasion of my privacy or you know like larger implications of terms of freedom and liberty <laughs> um, but again it's hard because the smartphone device itself it it helps and it hurts um, you know it's an extension of ourselves but then it's also um, it can invade our privacy and it can work against us, which is why it was really important for us to actually use the smartphone as a way into the conversation. So I mean, it's not, I think just like the interviews, it's not, um, we don't necessarily want to condemn all of surveillance because we do see you know, some of the benefits, um, but we also don't want to be on the other end of the spectrum either. So I kind of feel like I'm being very diplomatic and um, President Obama right now, because he's really good at that. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really know the specific answer. I don't know if you. I mean, it's a good point, and I think there is a convenience to it, and there is, I think, you know, highlighting that, highlighting the convenience, and taking those pictures, um, in a playful way, would be what I would think would be a great way to show that through our project. Play and protest is a wonderful thing that Carmel came off the top of her head during that interview because it is about play and protest. And certainly that may not serve to play, but it certainly does because there is like a nice, oh, okay, well, I don't have to think about, you know, what the weather is going to be or I change my thing. It, it just knows that. Um, to capture that convenience um, certainly is a positive thing. And I think it's a positive thing of being surveilled. Um, and, and, it, and it definitely fits within the realm of our project. Um, but again, we hand this over to you. This is a public art project. It is not, we don't own it. it. It's, it was meant for all of you. And if you look on the hashtag, the people that contributed, some we know, some we don't. And that's what's so awesome about it, tapping into the collective conscience. So we encourage you all to do so. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I think also an important thing, I mean, there's so much to talk about uh, with surveillance, but I mean, one thing we didn't get into uh, is also like privilege, um, you know, and depending surveillance and how we are surveilled is influenced a lot um, by certain kinds of social, cultural, economic, racial privilege that we have. So I think thinking about that too um, and always taking that into consideration when we're talking about surveillance is super important. Um, all right, so we're going to change um, from a sort of a traditional presentation format to, uh, to a performance uh, by a very good friend of mine. Her name is Una Aya Asato, uh, AKA Exotic Other uh, from Brown Girls Burlesque. And um, she's gonna be doing a piece from her one woman show. And uh, you, you're, you're all in for a treat. She's an amazing, wonderful performer. So we're gonna get ready for that. Ladies and
right, so the last presenters that I am going to bring up tonight uh, are, we are very, very fortunate to have the Illuminator crew with us here tonight. Um, and so they are going to come up and talk to you about their work and also show you some examples as well. So we have to use we have to use the mic because we're live streaming. Is that the story? Hello, hello. Yeah, that's a, that's the word. Um, does this work? Hello. Yeah, there's two. Uh, it feels it feels like a little overkill. There's only you know it's a small group and small room, but you know we'll amplify it. Uh, what the heck? So I think Grayson's going to pull up some photographs uh, so that you can kind of get a sense of the Illuminator project. But I, I was going to just give a kind of brief intro, and there's two short clips of video to talk about a couple of different projects we've been working on recently. Uh, the Illuminator grew out, emerged out of Occupy Wall Street movement. It was, uh, there was a bunch of projections on the Verizon building on November 17th, 2011. The Occupy Bat Signal was born there. Um, about 20,000 people were streaming over the pedestrian walkway and some messages and some call and response happened uh, on the bridge walkway. Um, and that, um, kind of went out very broadly. We used a big, uh, it's a kind of a big projector, a cinema projector, 12,000 lumen projector onto that, that sort of flat gray building for that. And after that, in, or in the aftermath of that, kind of came up with the idea of having a mobile intervention unit um, or spectacularization machine, um, which is a Ford Econoline van, <laughs> um, which you can't see here, but maybe we can see it somewhere. I don't know, click through some images. and. Um, yeah, sure. Scroll, scroll around. This is this has been our our tumbler for the last well, 2011. So, three years we've been doing this at this point. Um, uh, that's the van. There we go. Uh, so it's a 40 Econoline van. Um, it's been hacked. We worked with the Madagascar Institute um, to sort of hack the van and put in a a, a periscoping platform uh, that has a bunch of gear in there, and we can kind of swing it around um, and do these. Um, interventions in public space, and they're, and they're obviously they're they're social interventions in the public space itself, and they're also they live on social media. I mean, some of some of the some of the images and videos go fair, fairly travel fairly far, so they'll be seen by you know five six hundred thousand people or a million people, and um, they've been on uh, aired on television and so on and so forth. So they they propagate. It's a it's a way of intervening, I think, as I see it, in the sort of t the terrain of the dominant media spectacle that we see all the time, and sort of how do you um, how do you use or leverage uh, limited resources to get messages out that are otherwise ignored or perspectives that are otherwise sort of hidden um, from view, uh, including you know climate change um, as something that isn't isn't talked about in the context that I think we would want to talk about it um, in terms of a, a, ch a challenge to the entire social and economic order, really. Um, so we try to do this kind of work, um, and we've been doing it for three years. I think that's about all I, have, I would have to say about the overall um, kind of setup of the project, um, and that sets us up to, s to watch a uh, video from Montreal. Is that queued up? Or? Excellent. So we'll watch this, and then Grayson uh, will talk a little bit about the process that went into this. This was in Montreal over the summer, and then we'll, we'll look at another, briefly, some video from a more recent project, which is directly about surveillance state, which is a more of a theme for this evening. So we'll watch this and then let Grayson talk. Okay, yeah, there we go. So,
I'm Sebastian Grenier. I'm from. So actually, here, could you uh, cut Montreal. the volume? Sorry about that. We looked to the uh, building and. Cool. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So just to like contextualize what's going on here. Um, last summer, we teamed up with the Hemispheric Institute, and um, I embedded myself in Quebec for a month and worked with uh, student activists. Um, so what had happened there was. There were all the student movement uh, protests throughout 2012, sort of like around the same time as Occupy Wall Street. And um, the government, you know, was trying to raise tuition, and then the students and the uh, people of Montreal mobilized uh, in this amazing way. I think like a quarter of the, of the entire city was involved at one point. Um, and the end result was that they, they told them they were going to like not raise tuition, but then they implemented this law, P6, and P6 um, mandates that you can't protest with more than 50 people at one time without um, a permit from the police. And you have to send a map of where you're going. You have to give them a list of the names of the people involved uh, and these kind of things. And if you uh, don't do that, you are in direct violation. You have to pay like a $500 fine. Um, so in this case, we thought it'd be interesting to try and like circumvent this law using new media technology. So what we did was um, we went there and we recorded a bunch of uh, the student activists on a green screen sort of recreating these moments. Um, and we captured their signage um, and turned it into a video. And we sort of like, as you saw maybe in the beginning, um, compiled it so that there's this, there's this like virtual protest being staged back in the architectural realm of Montreal, back in actually like very close to where this is. Um, and throughout the city. So it's a way for us to get around this law while still bringing like the spectacular attention to it. Um, and uh, yeah, it was really interesting. We, uh, we almost got deported uh, by the Montreal Police Department. Um, and uh, this out here is out in front of uh, UCAM, which is the University of uh, Quebec at Montreal. And uh, it was really interesting to get people's perspectives. Um, they were, you know, it was it was really great opportunity all around, um, and so that that's sort of a piece of what we do, um, one of many interventions, um, and I guess uh, do you want to say anything more about that before we move on to the Oracle thing? Okay, cool. So then, uh, and you're going to talk about the Oracle's presence. Okay, cool. <laughs> so uh, we have one more video that we'd like to show. Um, and uh, oh yeah, there you can see this like virtual protest taking place. Oh, and on a plus que cinco means we are more than fifty. Um, so this is in sort of direct um, antagonism with uh, the P six law. Um, cool. So we'll show the video. Yeah. You you want to talk over it or go first? Uh, start with it first, actually. Cool. Need some sound. on the show today. <laughs> on the show today, ideas around privacy, what's been taken and what we've actually given. So in Utah, in a place called Bluffdale, it's about 20 miles south of Salt Lake City, there's a building and its sole purpose is to store secrets. Anyway, that data center in Utah, well, we have a better idea of what might be stored there thanks to Edward Snowden and his trove of classified data from the National Security Agency. And what we do know is that it's the first data storage facility in the world designed to store a yottabyte. So to put this into perspective, if your personal computer has like 60 gigabytes of storage, a yottabyte? is 16 trillion personal computers. I think you can uh, lower the volume. That's fine. Keep maybe the soundtrack going. That's such a good soundtrack, huh? Um, my name's Chris. I'm also with the Illuminator. And this was a project we did for Art Not Places at the New School. 
Um, uh, collectively, as a group, we're all quite interested in um, our s security online and a lot of the, the revelations that Edward Snowden made recently in 2013. So we wanted to make a project around that issue because this, this uh, festival with New School, which is putting art in, in the public place, uh, was around the theme of free. So this, the idea for this project was like, we want to think about the, the information, the pr very private information sometimes that we give away for free when we sign on to the internet and, and social media. So <laughs> in order to do that, what we did was use actually the same tools as the e evildoers in this case, like the NSA, which is we, we sort of um, read people's APIs or, or, or sweeped their information in, in the, on 14th Street and then projected that into the, into the public sphere, which is what, essentially what they're doing already, you know, d depending on what their security settings are. But if we could, if we could find all that information through Google searches and and, uh, and Facebook, then basically it's already made public. We were just making it very public. And uh, we do that as an intervention in the hopes that like, people will be like, well, wait a second, like, what am I doing? You know, like, think about where your information is going or how, how much information we can access by just carrying uh, a, a, a smartphone and, and keeping you know, your Wi-Fi on. It's connecting to other servers and stuff that, we, that people can actually access and use. So that's essentially the project. And I, we wanted to show today because this project is very much still a work in progress. This video actually is more of assembly, and it's just kind of B-roll going forward at this point. Um, so we love to hear a little bit more more perspectives on what other people think about intervening with people using this kind of method or approach. I think uh, it's just the reality. Almost everyone. Is I, I would. I would just. Put in a lot yeah, of and I would add a couple of things to that. One is like not only to you know make people to freak people out. Um, but beyond that, uh, to provide them with some information about how they can protect their privacy, um, which we were also distributing that information on flyers and, uh, and on the landing page of the site that you guys created as well, so that there's links to like how, what steps that you can take to kind of uh, protect yourself a little bit. That is as much about calling out a problem, but also you know, like, you know, positing some kind of remedy, um, some kind of action, simple things that you can actually take. Um, so that, and they also, these guys were, were taking snapshots of what they were projecting and tweeting it to the people who they would like they would get their Twitter handle and tweet it at them and then people were tweeting back like what the fuck are you doing um, it was kind of it was an interesting intervention in that way um, so we would love to hear perspectives on the ethics of that I guess <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or what people think about all that yeah. oh yeah uh, we were, yeah, we were. What they were doing, um, as I understand it, was that they, they could um, geographically scrape an, an entire area, like who, and find out who was tweeting or posting on Instagram within a sort of radius. And then, and then once they had a name, we had a couple of people in the back of the van, just like Google searching and like finding anything they could very quickly, and then posting it. Um, which yeah, was so the, actual, the actual goal, which was never met, was to get somebody in the space to see themselves projected. But it's kind, it's pretty hard to do that actually. Um, we got pretty close, but we kind of think that on 14th Street they're just like jumping into the subway or something and missing that. But so then we thought, oh, we can tweet it at them. Like at least they'll see a projection of their information back at them, and th that that was really interesting and weird. But yeah. Any any ideas? be projecting um, some a drone video art project uh, here and you can take a look at the van and like you know scope our equipment ask us more stuff there too if that sounds interesting to you right around the corner Um, I just was wondering like personally how it at uh, your projects amazing and uh, it's and like personally what are the um, risks that you're taking when you do this um, kind of have there been surveillance or harassment of you all and um, yeah, yeah why don't you handle that one? <laughs> we um, it's kind of a funny um, dance with the authorities because it's it's um it is actually explicitly illegal to project the amount of light that we project um, but it's it's a law that's a little bit a little bit buried your average cop doesn't know about these these kind of laws. It's not like a they do now. <laughs> um, right. 
great. Hello, NYPD. Um, but so we kind of do this dance. We all wear like uniforms when we do this. We, um, yeah, Grayson's wearing his. I forgot to bring mine. Um, yeah, we have this kind of like union look. We're operating out of a commercial vehicle. Um, a lot of distraction tactics say, yeah, we're art students. We're doing a project or we're doing this and that. Um, we did, there's been, um, I guess, three instances where people were arrested with the project. There was the, the first, the Verizon building action. Like, no, no specific people on the roof were arrested or something. Um, the only two times that Illuminator crew members were specifically arrested were for once we projected on um, uh, Bloomberg's private residence, and, and that ended in an arrest. Um, the second time was uh, two months ago, a little over two months ago. Um, Grayson and I and someone else were arrested for projecting on the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, we were jamming, um, I guess it was, it was a fundraiser, right? For Yeah, yeah da 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 David Koch had, it was a gala, yeah. So D David H. Koch gave the Metropolitan Museum of Art $65 million to build a new plaza in front of the museum. And that's now named the David H. Koch Plaza and has his name chiseled in stone in various, you know, it's, um, there's a lot of, in my opinion, ethical concerns around that issue. And so we were aiding an on-the-ground protest that was happening with light um, and were arrested. Um, and so we're now, they actually impounded our projector for over two months, two months, ten days. We just got that back two days, three, one, one, three days ago. Um, and we are still kind of wrapped in a lawsuit around that. It's, it's interesting. Um, but yeah, I guess, like, I don't know. I'm kind of going on for a while about that. But it's, we generally don't have problems, you know? Um, it's kind of this. <laughs> it's more like who's in office. Also, like, if we're aiding, if we're aiding a protest seems to be more of a situation, right? We just, uh, but it's really hard to tell. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Just to clarify, it's protected speech. I mean, as uh, our understanding is that there's a couple statutes that are on the books. One is, one is like if you're shining in someone's window, that's an act of trespass. And two is if you're posting actual advertisements, that's illegal. You can't post illegal advertisements, which is what they were charged with, and it was dismissed because we weren't advertising. Um, so those are the two statutes that are actually operative. And otherwise, we're yeah, that would be well that. Mm, interfering with commerce. I don't think that that's ever come up. The, the, our lawyers have researched it and they've written us letters and this is what they understand it to be protected speech. Uh, you know, it is subject to a permitting regime, which we're not getting permits for it, so we're in, we're in violation of a permitting regime that's different than being uh, involved in a crime. It's a violation, not a crime, like a parking ticket. Anyway, technically that's sort of what's going on. I'm curious as to how you determine which projects uh, you want to be involved with and if there are certain projects that maybe you have declined to give your aid to, why you decided that you didn't want to be involved. So uh, we collectively decide, I guess, at our meetings, um, talk about, you know, sometimes it comes up through email first and we just kind of all respond, uh, yeah, sounds great, let's do it. Um, if it's something, you know, that needs more discussion, then we'll talk about it at a meeting. Um, let's see, uh, in terms of things that we've declined, I, as far as I know, I'm a newer member and as far as I know, the only times we've declined um, this year have mostly been because we've been like already booked. Like we've been really busy doing lots of things and sometimes people are asking us to help out when we're already doing something else. Um, but you guys maybe can talk about other... So, funny story involving Woody Harrelson and his bad play, Adolf, uh, Bull Bullet for Adolf. Um, he, made a, he wrote a play called Bullet for Adolf. He was doing it on Broadway or off-Broadway. 
And we do work, well, the way we're able to sustain this is we do work for hire. Um, we've done work for Greenpeace and Sierra Club, and we also do work like we sh like what we showed you, which is just our own work, and we do collectively. So we kind of like run this, kind of run this gamut and this fine line between working a worker-owned cooperative business and an ac activist art collective, and we kind of like operate in both of these um, modalities. Um, and as part of that, early on, um, we were contacted, I was contacted through Woody Harrelson's people, it's he's he's been an activist and he's like hung a banner from the Golden Gate Bridge about climate change and um, earth kind of earth firsty actions. He's a super stoner. I know people that have worked with him, um, but he he contacted us. He was like, hey, I got this idea. I really want you to like promote our play. Um, it's called Bullet for Adolf. Um, what I really want you guys to do is roll around town for a few nights and project uh, Hitler is coming. Um, in various locations, and and he actually said, um, um, "This is slander. I could get sued for this." But he, I actually did say this. He was like, "He was like, you know, you should go places where like a lot of Jewish people hang out, like Lincoln Center, and like go project Hitler is coming." <laughs> and uh, we declined. Oh, yeah. You're going to mention um, what's going on next. Is that yeah, right? Great. Cool. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Um, okay. So there is going to be a projection that happens in about maybe 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and these, the fabulous Illuminator crew is going to go get that set up. Um, and so what you're going to see is um, it's, um, it's kind of, it's like raising awareness. It's commentary on the use of drones and specifically the MQ-1 Predator drone which uh, is currently the most commonly used drone in combat missions. Um, and so you're going to be seeing a split screen. And um, on the left side of the screen is actually an amazing project by Shobun, Shobun Bale, who's actually here tonight. Um, and, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong or if you want to add anything else. Um, but so his project is actually looking at photos that have been uploaded um, from uh, drone strike locations um, and it's specifically looking at like the digital interfaces um, I want to I want to actually read your uh, your description so that I don't so that I don't mess this up um, so the project stems from the living under drones report of 2012 as well as reports on the marked increase in the usage of anti-anxiety and antidepressant medications in regions where US military drones first showed their presence um, and so he's been interested in um, looking at the uh, engaging in the mundane everyday action of scrolling through images on Flickr. Um, and so the project extended into how people and communities are represented through our colonial interfaces, uh, from a drone's eye peering at the architecture of one's home to an iPhone fluidly sliding their family's photos past us, each interface reiterating itself as a mode of remote colonialism. Um, so that's on the left-hand side of the screen, and then on the right-hand side of the screen is actually um, footage from Predator drone strikes. Um, and so it's it's putting, you know, it's trying to demystify sort of the like the idea of drones because uh, we we hear we hear about them a lot, but we don't actually ever see their shape, um, and then we actually you know very rarely are kind of put in direct contact with folks that are living in um, under the kind of threat of everyday drone strikes. Um, so that's sort of a brief overview of what you're going to see. If you guys want to head down to the gallery, I think there's another talk starting at 7. Is that right? Okay, great. Awesome. Yeah, so um, we can stick around here. You can head down to the gallery, and then when the projection is ready, we'll make an announcement if folks want to come out um, and take a look at that. So thank you guys so much.